Hey, it's Will Hawkins with Headliner Magazine, and we're continuing our tour of amazing studios and the engineers that use them. Today, we're in the Hollywood Hills, and we're gonna to talk to Stefan Marsh with Marsh Mastering Studios. And he's gonna go over some of the tricks of his trade, show some of his equipment, and his amazing lathe machine that is one of the few here in Los Angeles. So follow me and let's go talk to him. Hey, Steph, are you here? Hey, how's it going? Will Hawkins from Headliner Magazine. I've got some friends with me. Do you mind if we come in and check your place out? Not at all. Come right on. on, let's go check it out. Thanks for being with us today, Stefan. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the mastering process for those who may not understand what it is or even heard about it? So the mastering process is essentially the, the completion of the recording. It's inherently about sound. And the way we manipulate sound is the process of mastering. That is literally the very sort of basic version of what mastering is. But the goal isn't necessarily to make anything sound different. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to understand. It's to make you feel different. One of the primary functions of mastering is just to sort of finish the mixes, but also to make sure they're presented properly and formatted uh, appropriately for the different streaming formats. Uh, production for vinyl, Atmos, distribution in different ways like that. It's about increasing the connection between the artist and their creation, their vision, and the, and the audience. Mastering is so specific, and I don't think a lot of people understand why it's important to you, someone who is an expert in the field. How would you explain that to someone who would rather do it themselves as opposed to hiring you? For somebody working at home, especially if they're working on their own music, I think one of the greatest challenges to mastering yourself is perspective. A lot of artists, like especially these days where you're doing a lot of things yourself, you may have recorded your own parts, you may have done some of the mixing yourself or some of the pre-mixing. There's a lot going on that you're, it's all up there already. You're considering it on too many levels already. When I come into the situation, I'm considering it on only one level. How am I reacting as a new audience to this creation, to this work? And it's a much different expression that I'm going to feel from the music than somebody that's way inside of it. How long does it take you to master a track? If it's a straightforward, well, well mixed, ready to go pop song, we might be done in 20 minutes. Soup to nuts, one song. If it's a piece of score where it's four different cues that they've sweeted together or we've sweeted together in here and they have different tonalities, we have to match those tonalities. Uh, score music we have to go through and clean performance noises and sometimes click track bleed or headphone bleed. You might spend three hours doing one song in that case. There are so many different ways to become an engineer. You could be a mix engineer, recording engineer. How did you choose mastering? An opening came up in the mastering department for the studio that I worked at first. Um, and very graciously, the engineer that ran that studio at the time went to the boss and said, hey, I know we just fired so-and-so. This kid seems like he's smart, why don't you give him a shot? And he vouched for me and got me in the room and let me to pass or, you know, to succeed or fail on my own, uh, to, if I'm honest, but um, he got me in the door and it was huge, so. How soon after getting in that door did you realize you had an affinity for it? Very, very quickly. I, I got into mastering and within maybe two months or three months, I knew, I, I knew that the things that had always puzzled me about mixing that I thought I would spend my life sort of figuring out as a form of a career. I didn't have those questions with mastering. I understood music from the outside in much, much better than I understood music from the inside out. And as a young mastering engineer, who were some of the other mastering engineers that you admired? When I moved to LA to, to start mastering, it was the, all the legends were still working back then, which is great. And a few of them are still here, but um, you know, in, in LA, it's Bernie Grumman and Wally Trogett back at Capitol and Doug Sachs at the Mastering Lab. I mean, these are people that created my job. You know, they took mastering from a perfunctory process of translating something off of one media and getting it on another media so they can mass produce it and elevated it to the art that it is now. If, if we're going to consider, if we, if we accept the posit that mastering is art, those guys created that. I remember when I was a young engineer and I was in Ted Jensen's studio and he did one album after another. I asked him what he listened to when he went home. Curious to hear his answer to that question. Nothing. <laughs> I had a feeling. Nothing, he Me said. Too. So I was gonna ask you, how do you deal with ear fatigue and when do you know enough's enough? I tend to deal with fatigue by breaking up my day. 
Um, I am very fortunate that over time, I, I have a lot of varied interests and I've found ways to sort of make them all kind of work as my whole life is one big side hustle as it were. Because I do mastering, but I also cut records. I also do tech work, I also fix gear. and Most of my time is spent in here, probably 70% of my day. Mm -hmm. But I get to spend 30% of my day doing other things that are also work related. And that helps me break it up because I can't focus I used to, when I was younger, I could sit in the studio and focus for 12 straight hours and just master that whole time. I can't do that anymore. How does mastering for Atmos differ from mastering for stereo? One of the biggest differences between stereo mastering, and my hands inherently do this and you'll understand in a moment, from stereo mastering to Atmos mastering is, a lot of stereo mastering is about making things bigger and bringing them closer to you. And so much of Atmos mastering is actually not necessarily pushing them away, but allowing them to remain at a distance if they should be at a distance. The great thing about Atmos is it's one sort of format that allows you to birth many smaller formats from it. The way those things are birthed is all programmed in during the mastering process, so that's important. Making sure that they meet delivery spec in terms of overall level and the way the files are formatted, uh, and then all the metadata. Can you explain your Atmos setup and why yours is unique compared to maybe somebody else's? Our Atmos setup here is Pyramix based, and we work all within one system. So I've got a Pyramix on a DAW and a PC, and my Dolby renderer also running on the same PC and everything talks via the merging audio driver. Um, all of the monitoring gets handled between the uh, Dolby renderer and the Pyramix DAW via internal links that Pyramix has all set up and established. Uh, and then my monitoring uh, comes through an Anubis, which is in monitor mission, and it allows me to completely control the entire, the ceiling channels, all the bed channels, uh, solo, mute, volume, that kind of thing. It will also give me down mixes, which is great. Uh, one part of, of Atmos is making sure that all the down mixes translate. So when you've got, if a consumer is playing it back in a 714 environment or 712, 514, 51, two channel, binaural, uh, we want to make sure that those all sort of, they're not all going to sound the same, but they need to all sound like they are of a piece, right? Mm -hmm. They need to all make sense together and they all, nothing needs to sound foreign. So the newest allows me to go through and, and swap through all that stuff very quickly, which is nice. How did you come across merging technologies and how's that been a breakthrough for the work that you've done here? Uh, merging technologies I came to in maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And it was a, a, f a function of necessity. I needed to work in DSD and they were sort of, they weren't necessarily the only game in town, but they were the only they were the only company offering a true end-to-end -end solution that was mature and supported and still continuing to be developed. The byproduct of that was I found that it was a system that literally did everything I needed it to do. Whereas traditionally, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the standard of mastering would be to do what's called pitch catch. So you have one computer system, DAW, that's going to receive all of your source files, all your mixes, you're gonna play those down through your analog console and capture that or catch it with another DAW. And that would be your mastering workstation. You know, I used to work with a Pro Tools and a Sonic Solutions. What I found was Pyramix replaced both of them. Pyramix allows me to work with all the material in one unit, in one DAW. It will allow me to work with mixed sample rates, mixed bit depths. It doesn't seem to care. All of my plugins work at high resolution. And what it allows me to do is have one version of everything. So what, I, what do I do? I work at the very highest resolution at DSD and then everything can come down off of that. So I only have to edit and assemble it once. I only have to proof it once. I only have to QC it once. I only have to do all the metadata, all the clerical manipulation once. And then it can go out as all the different formats that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And that's all because of Pyramix. The versioning and the creation of multiple assets and deliverables just like that is, it's unparalleled as far as in my experience in the industry. The integration between all the merging products, and in here we have Pyramix as the DAW, we have Hoppy as our main DDA and A to D, and then I have an Anubis as my monitor controller. The beauty of the is that they all just work. How is the Anubis implemented in your chain, and how does it work with your interface? My Anubis is integrated in my chain here uh, as my monitor controller. It's in the monitor, what they call the monitor mission. Um, and it essentially replaced my main stereo monitor controller. When you're uh, critically listening to audio, you need to be able to filter it in certain ways to be able to expose different elements of it quickly and easily just to find out what's going on. Mono, flipping phase, mono in phase inversion to, to bring out the sides or to bring out the middle. The Nubus handles all of that 
really cleanly. Whereas my original console just did two channel, the Anubis does everything from stereo all the way up to the Atmos. So the interface is super clean, it's easy to use. And again, it's once you sort of get into the thinking of the way merging stuff operates, it's really easy to make it to make it go fast. Well, I understand that you have a lathe system downstairs. How did you get into cutting vinyl? When I first got into mastering in the uh, mid 90s, people were still cutting them, but very limited. And it was primarily in a, just a couple of genres and it wasn't something we didn't, I started off at Sony Music Studios and they didn't have a lathe on the West Coast at the time. So I never cut much. I was more like in a couple cutting sessions about as far as I got to it. I was, I had the opportunity to purchase a working, full, full, full working system. So we jumped on it, restored it, brought it up to snuff, and uh, we've been going gangbusters down there ever since. We have a Scully, 1947 Scully lathe that's been fully updated and modified. Uh, with a cutting computer, et cetera, et cetera, to cut modern records. There seems to be a greater demand for vinyl these days. What do you attribute that to? Uh, one, uh, the sound is unique. I'm not gonna say it's better or worse, but it's unique, and there are scientific reasons behind why it is. I also think that consumers have, especially hardcore music consumers, have become much more savvy. Like, they understand, everybody understands artists aren't getting any money from Spotify. It's not something that just is in the industry and people are shocked when they find that out. Like, it's a known thing. But by the same token, the other half of that is artists know that when they buy an album directly from the artist, the artist is getting the lion's share of that money. So it's about supporting the art, I think. And you know, I think it was a study a couple years ago, they said that upwards of 50% of people that they interviewed that were purchasing records at a particular store, they weren't even gonna play them. It was just like, well, we're just, it's, we wanna support the artist, we want the art, I'm gonna frame it, I'm gonna put it up on my wall or whatever. And I think that's one of the things that propels vinyl. It's not just the, the experience of listening to, to the music in a different way and the sound of it. It's every part of it. It's the artwork. It's the aspect of putting it down, listening to a side and flipping over and listening to another side. And is there a different mastering approach when you know that the music's going to vinyl? Um, most projects these days won't go exclusively to vinyl, but almost every project does go to vinyl. Um, so we will make slight modifications to the audio for the cutting master, for the cutting version. So what's the average time it takes to cut one side of vinyl? Yeah. It's, if everything's working right today, it's about double. So if, you're, if you have a fully prepped file and you're gonna go cut, let's say a 22 minute side, um, it's probably gonna take you about 45 minutes to cut it. But the actual disc cut happens in real time. So if it's a 20 minute side, it takes 20 minutes. And what's coming out next that you're really excited about that you've worked on? I think the, the thing I'm most excited about is the Don't Worry Darling, this new um, Harry Styles film. It's a John Powell score, and we mastered it in stereo and surround. It lends itself to Atmos so naturally. With it's a it's a psychological thriller film, and there's stuff coming at you from every which way, and voices screaming. I think it's one of the best sounding things I've ever got the chance to work on. But it's also, I think, one of the best examples or one of the best demonstrations for the for Atmos as a format that I've ever heard. The music is almost just custom tailored for the Atmos format. It sounds amazing. I can't wait to hear it. Well, thanks so much for inviting us into your studio today. It's been great getting to know you a little better and to get an idea of what your process here is. Sure.